Good morning, church. Good morning. Oh, I, no, you're nowhere near as loud as the kids. <laughs> they got up to being as loud as uh, like a jackhammer. I had like a little decibel meter uh, using my phone and as loud as a helicopter taking off. I mean, they could do it. So I gained renowned, renewed sympathy for parents, but now I also understand why teachers don't allow kids to run wild and loud in the halls at school because they'd all be deaf. We had a great week this week, as Mark shared some of that uh, with you all. And part of the theme of it, and I kind of miss our backdrop that was there, was this idea of God's creative work in us, that, that really there is this role we each have to play, uh, and God is creating and working and doing a good work in us. He's created us, like Ephesians 2.10 says, uh, for, for His purposes, works for His glory that He's prepared in advance for us to do. He's He's got each one of you something that he wants you to do. It's kind of like a story. You'll hear me tell this one again and again because I love the way this nails it down. Uh, a king was looking at his garden and he saw one little corner of it that was just a little empty and he asked the gardener to plant uh, like an apple tree and, and roses and maybe just like a, a little daisy bush, little daisies right here, just right there at the front of it all and, and went away. The king went away. And while he was gone, the... Uh, the apple tree looked at the rose bush and said, man, if I could just have beautiful flowers, I think the king would really appreciate that. He'd like that a lot. If I, if I could just have some, some nice, soft, sweet-smelling flowers like that rose bush down there. The rose bush looked up at the tree and said, if I could be tall and have lots of branches, the, the king, when he comes back, man, he, would, he would look at me and be so happy. Uh, after a while, the, the king did come back, and he noticed that the apple tree, though it had uh, a lot of branches, it had no fruit. It had been trying so hard to just have flowers. And the rose bush had spent so much time working at having this like thick trunk there, and this woody trunk, and these branches that went out, and lots of leaves, but no roses. And the daisy was just covered with Sweet little humble yellow blooms. And the king talked to them and said, why? why? Why is it this way? And the apple tree said, I thought you'd like it if I was more like the rose bush. And the rose bush said, I thought you'd like me if I was more like the tree. And the simple little daisy just answered back, I just figured you'd wanted daisies when you put me here. So I just made daisies. Isn't that the way we are? You know, I get to stand up here on a Sunday and look at church and say, you know, there really aren't a lot of reasons all of y'all would get in the room for an hour other than Jesus Christ to bring you together. I mean, you have different families, different works, different interests. I mean, really, there's a lot of things that you might have in common with some people here, but the one thing we all have in common, I pray, is we're here to worship what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. I mean, that's why we're here. And we hope that that would be so contagious while we're here doing that, that there would be some that might come and might be guests with us, that they would say, oh, oh, I, I want to know about that Jesus. Like little children, like just being here day in, day out, they, they heard that from, from four-year-olds up to 10, 11, 12-year-olds. They, they heard that word and, and got that. And like Mark said, getting to counsel with some uh, it was so exciting to hear some 9- and 10-year-olds that just had it. They had, had gotten the word, and they weren't parroting it back. They weren't just saying whatever a teacher had said or what parents wanted them to say or just saying to the pastor things like little kids say sometimes when they're not quite there. They're asking questions, but they're not quite there yet. When they say, well, I want to be baptized. I mean, that's what some kids think of, right, when they want to become a Christian. No, these understood what God wanted of them, just them, their life, to have Jesus in charge of it, and that he died for their sin, and God raised him from the dead on the third day, or as some of the pre kers said, 33 months, right, the, the Kellys, the, some of the pre kers didn't quite get it exactly right, but there are four, we, they, they got the story. So again, that's where we are, and, and that's where we're looking at today. We're going to be in Acts uh, 1 and 2. You can go and turn to there. But what I want you to think about is that God's 
God's creative work in your life has some evidences now. I mean, there's things that are unique about him in your life now, but, but I want you to hear this hope. It's going to be even more so later, more so as you follow Christ, and even more so the day of the great resurrection when we are in his presence forever. All of his creative work in your life will bloom and show. And that's really why we're in this together. I mean, that's what we're moving toward together. And so that, that means that our faithful obedience now is a part of this long story that can impact generations to come. Um, you remember last week we looked at the anointing of, of David, this little shepherd boy David out there. And we talked a little bit about the faithfulness of the generations before him. But today we're going to talk about how the faithfulness of those generations and of that King David and of his obedience to God pointed ahead to an anointing that began on the day of Pentecost that filled the church and fills it still today. I mean, it really does make a difference to be faithful to God in the task at hand. Whether you're a daisy or an apple tree or a rose bush or I don't know, whatever you are, you have that before you. And that reach that's there. So that said, the great impact of your life, man, as you go out of here, it's not a Labor Day message necessarily, but think about this. It may be that the greatest impact of your life is to be the best parent, the best child, the best student, the best teacher, the best employee, the best supervisor, the best neighbor, the best friend, whatever label there is on you that you can possibly be for the sake of the kingdom of God and for the glory of the gospel. Mark said it, VBS was incredible this week. The children learned about God's work in us. The Bible verse that they looked at again to kind of refer back to it on the screen was that, and I'd like for you to say it with me. If you, can, can you read that? Is that, do we get it big enough? Is, uh, it says, so read it with me, ready? One, two, three. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do, Ephesians 2.10. The kids always know to do the reference at the end. But that, that text is a part of how God's work. It's all part of that theme, whether it be the, the 202 kids that our leaders worked with and served with, the, the organization that went in before it by Ashley, the follow-up that's happening after with families of those who made decisions for Christ, some from our congregation, some from other churches, some don't have a family that takes them to church. So there's stuff to follow up on that. We need to be a part of that uh, there. And then if you look around today and you see 48 people that are like sleeping through the sermon, I give them permission because they really worked hard this last week. They were the volunteers in VBS. But like I said, we looked last week at the beginning of David's influence. Uh, God's setting a part of him as king under Samuel's hand in a difficult time being anointed. And so that happened, but through the lineage of David and his faithfulness, and you may or may not know this, but you know in Luke perhaps and in Matthew, there's this genealogy of Jesus and David's in it. And Jesus as uh, he came in and was seen as the people, as the one who would be the, the great king since King David to lead the people, to lead the country, to be this kind of earthly kingdom. Uh, that's not exactly how that all happened for everybody, and we'll look at that story in a bit. But here we see David's influence that began culminates in Christ. It is the highest work that happens. So the passage today comes from Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 14, and then skips a bit into chapter 2, verses 25 through 36. So if you've got your Bible open, you'll be kind of in the right spot. We'll, we'll look at that, and you can go back and look at more of the body of the text a little bit later. But, but what's happening here is Jesus is alive. After the crucifixion, after he'd been nailed to the cross, after he'd gone there willingly, purposefully, to be 
crucified for the sake of the sins of the world. And they'd placed him in a tomb, and on the third day, they'd heard from the angels, he's not here, he is risen. It's my wife, she knows to do that, yeah. He is not here, he is risen, he is risen indeed. That's our blessing, we say. We remember that he is alive, and so they are interacting with him in this text. I mean, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, like 500 people had the opportunity to hang with this resurrected Jesus. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's, you, you can't get 500 people to make up and stick to a story when they're all being persecuted. So these folks here encounter him, and it says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. So this is good, resurrection. Baptists, we still get to eat. Just if you're kind of looking for a tidbit out of the verse there. But Jesus gives a command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. And you can go back and look at John 14, 15, 16, 17 about that. He says, for John baptized with water, but in a few days... You will be baptized, and that word there means immersed, dunked, covered, soaked with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Remember, they haven't gotten the Holy Spirit yet. They're still kind of operating on this and this and, you know, what do we know in the past and what's our framework there and, and Jesus has just told them, you know, to wait. And, and they acted in a way like none of you would, they, right? They were impatient. They're like, are we going to do this now? Is it going to happen? Am I going to get to see this? And they're expecting there's going to be this earthly kingdom that's going to happen. And Jesus' response to them is, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, right? And that doesn't need a lot of preaching, a lot of exposition. I don't know why I have to explain that so many times when people want to say, hey, is this a sign of the end times? Or I've got this book that says, hey, this is why Jesus is coming back next month or something like that. Jesus, it's not our job to know that. That's not, that's not our job. So anytime somebody comes to you with that, maybe you can kind of give that not my job answer. It's not my job to know that. He says, but you do have this one. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's our job. That's what we get to be. I mean, we're not sitting around twiddling thumbs going, ooh, I see, it looks like uh, um, gas is high. That's a sign Jesus is coming back. That's not our job. That's not our job. Our job is to be the powerful, living presence of the resurrected Christ wherever we're planted, wherever we step, wherever we go. Uh, last Sunday in the greater church, you know, there's churches that kind of follow a church calendar year, but if you looked at Actually, the, the history of the days. Last Sunday would have fallen on what would be Pentecost Sunday, the miracle of Pentecost, that story. And some of you are familiar with that in Acts 2, where they're gathered together, and they're, uh, the disciples are there in the room, Mary, others, part of the church are there with them, uh, and the Holy Spirit falls upon them like tongues of fire, and they, they go out and they began to witness to the people, not in unknown, ununderstandable tongues, but in actual languages of the people who had come from other places, and they're witnessing and telling them about Jesus the Christ. And Peter gets up and he preaches this first great sermon of the church. This guy that said three times in the night, even to a little girl, that he was so scared that he didn't even know Jesus. In fact, he even swore he didn't know Jesus gets up and delivers the sermon in Acts chapter 2. And again, you can read into that. And as he's getting through there, he's saying in this one text, 
And it says, David said about him, being, being Jesus, because he's talking about who this was. I mean, it was, it was all the story of the town, right? People knew what had happened. Some people had been killed by the Romans. There had been riotous uproar in the streets. The news was about. The buzz was there. And he says, this is who it was. This was about Jesus of Nazareth, and he was the Son of God. And David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Hundreds of years before David, this little shepherd boy, this little rock-throwing giant killer, this guy who lived right and lived even wrong, but lived aware of the grace gift of God and the awareness of his presence, this one said, he's beside me. I will not be shaken. David saw the sight of the Savior, and it fueled and influenced and directed his leadership and his life for those folks. And so then he goes on to say, Peter says, therefore, let all Israel be assured, comforted, certain. Know this is not a non-negotiable. He says, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. And every time I read that, I think of that's pointing at me, right? You know, what's still little kid things. You know, I've got one finger pointing out, but three pointing back, right? But it's, it's us. Jesus would have been crucified by us if we'd been standing in the crowd. We were a part of it. We're as guilty of it. He says, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. I just need to correct one thing before we go on to some, some follow-up on this real quick. So often, and I don't know who said it first, but it's kind of what we say when we, we tell people, say, hey, we want you to make Jesus Lord and Savior of your life, right? That's what we ask sometimes we want people to become a Christian. I got to straighten it out. God's already made him the Lord. You don't do that. He's already Lord of your life. The question is, do you want the judgment now or later? Now is best. You want his judgment on the sin on your life now because then he takes the guilt to the cross and pays the price for it, and you don't. He is Lord. So you don't make him Lord. You just say, I get it. Jesus is Lord. You don't make him Messiah. You know, a lot of times we make these Messiahs out of our own mind, these kind of saviors, these kind of heroes, this kind of idea of how we could be rescued and what we need God to do to fix things in our life. And we, we build this kind of human idol of what a Savior would be. We don't get to dictate how Jesus saves. God did that. He is the Messiah you need even for what you don't need. So again, you don't make Jesus Lord and Savior. God's already said He is. So when we ask you to be a Christian, I'm just asking you to say, oh, I get it. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. I believe that, and I'm going to commit my life to that. It's that easy. If you've never done that, when we close today, I just want to invite you to do this. Why don't you run down here to the front, and let's pray, and you do it. Nobody's going to judge you. If they do, that's their own problem. I've kind of told you I'm a little more like my, my West Texas dad. I don't care. This is about eternal stuff. Let's get it right. I mean, if you just need to make it certain, we're not going to make a, it's not a big production. We're not, I mean, it's just, we just want to make sure that's right for you today. Because when it comes right down to it, the amazing truth of the gospel, of the good news in our lives is that everything we think could be a down is an up. Everything we think that could be disaster is actually a recovery for us. And so three things, they're on the screen there for us about how, how do we look at this story and get up from a down, because that's what happened with the disciples, right? Jesus, they'd been following him. Everybody thought he was great. He's crucified. He's dead. He's buried. We're kind of in hiding. We're quiet now. Jesus says, go and Go there and go to this one place, get in this one room, spend time praying together, and wait. Waiting doesn't seem like a big uptime a lot of times for folks. And in the midst of the waiting, the up comes from the down. And for the disciples, what happens first is they engage the moment that they're in. Right there. 
wherever they are, they are stuck to it. They get connected to it. They are there. The disciples were told to go and gather and pray, and they did. They were told to wait, and they did. They were then led to witness, and they did. Waiting is not the pause button of life. When God puts you into a waiting mode, when you have something you're waiting for God to do, when you're, you, you have this sense of hope or direction that, you know, when you're following Jesus, sometimes it's like, okay, you need to study this, you need to wait for this, you need to, uh, you need to take, it's not, you're not being put in suspended animation. Waiting takes energy. I mean, waiting really is moving. What, you wait in line at a restaurant or a store or movie or traffic, e- even in Woodville sometimes. We wait. And the problem is, sometimes when we wait, we lose our focus. But when we're waiting, we need to be engaged even in that moment because we can all battle this spiritual attention deficit disorder sometimes, right? When, when we're like, doesn't feel like God's doing anything exciting right now, we're like, oh, well, I'm thinking about something else right now. No, we need to focus through the reading of Scripture, through prayer, through conversation, through being in a Bible study group. We, we have these on Sunday morning at, at 9.30. We need more. Man, if you want to be in one, I, I'll just help you get one going. Just talk to me. We need to do that where people are here studying God's Word together so that we are engaged in the moment when the Spirit comes, we we get it. Because when we wait, we develop these habits and practices that are rewarded. For the disciples, it was getting together in community and praying and waiting. And it was rewarded by the power of God. Now, Another way to get up from those down moments is to have this vision of the Messiah, right? To really envision what it is, to have this expectant hope of God working in our lives. We engage a moment with daily obedience, but we also have a hope beyond the moment. Where we are is not where we're always going to be. It's not always going to be Sunday. It's not always going to be sunshine and flowers, although we need rain. It's not always going to be just like it is. David's prophecy was saying such. Peter's preaching spoke of the real hero's deliverance, the Messiah that would be for all humankind. We live in a world that's really familiar with Messiah stories. I mean, you go to a movie, it's got either a superhero or some superhuman, or whether it's Star Wars or Marvel or Top Gun, at the end of the day, there's somebody in there that's the hero, right? Right? I mean, that's part of our culture, part of our storytelling. Where do you think it comes from? It's just a substitute for the real Messiah. For when you know who the real Messiah is, you can recognize the others aren't. The others aren't. The other things you think that will save you a a bigger bank balance or better health or more popularity, uh, that's not your Messiah. Those are false gods. Jesus alone delivers. And our hope is in Him. So kind of look at those things in your life that you think are your hope. And if any one of them are ahead of Christ, take them out. And the third thing is, uh, not only do we have this expectant hope, this daily obedience that helps us to get engaged in vision, we have a mission that we get to be a part of energized energizing. You get to have your story. You get to have a testified leadership in what goes on. Jesus calls them to be witnesses there in Jerusalem where they are, in Judea, in Samaria, in the ends of the earth, and across the ages to you today, right? I mean, not a one of us are here because we just all of a sudden popped out of the sky and said, I think it'd be a great idea to know about Jesus and God's Word. No, somebody told you. Somebody encouraged you, somebody equipped you, somebody obediently was engaging their moment in prayer and knew about the Messiah, had a, had a true idea that Jesus is the Messiah, and then they said, I'm going to tell somebody. I'm going to be a part of something that tells somebody with my time and my talent and my treasure, whether it be uh, wearing myself out with 202 children that are so loud, or whether it's ministering to uh, a group in, the, in a Bible study, somehow, some way you're a part of energizing the mission. 
I mean, that's what church is, right? We're not a monument to what God has done, right? We're a movement for God's mission every day. We're not a memorial, we're a movement. And that's who we are. So this act of obedience is this expectation of God to share the message and to be this witness. Now, when we think of witnesses, you may think of like some law show you've seen on TV, right? I'm just old enough to remember my grandparents watching Perry Mason. And I'm sure there was something before that. But then you get all the way through to whether it be in the movies or L.A. Law on TV, whatever. They all are about highlighting the skill of the courtroom attorney, right, to be able to make it happen. But when it comes down to it, what's really needed is a truthful witness. I mean, we don't, we're, not, we're not in apologies to the lawyers. I'm not trying to make them sound unnecessary. But that's not our job. Our job is to be the one testifying to the truth of God's work in our life. So if Jesus has led you, you've got the truth. You've got the story. You don't have to have like a six-year-long witnessing training experience. You, You know your story. If he's leading you, you can tell it. And you can do it. You know how I know that? Because the same Holy Spirit that came upon Peter and the apostles and that filled the church on that day fills every believer the day they say, Jesus is Lord and Messiah. You're not waiting on it. It happens. It happens. It shows us that in the Word. So you have that power from on high within you to share. And the testimony, when it's given at the end of that scene, it demands a verdict, doesn't it? I mean, the jury has to stand up and and give evidence and say, hey, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what have you decided? And they say, we've decided not guilty, whatever they decide, that verdict. Testimony that you share about God's leadership in your life requires it as well. Peter gives testimony here in his, uh, his preaching that he gives, and it gets to a time of decision in Acts chapter 2, 37 and 38. It's not, not on the screen, but it says, when the people heard this, that is that Jesus is Lord and Messiah, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and that's figuratively, not literally, figuratively. And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what do we do? What shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Boom. If if you're here today and you've, you've never gotten to that point where you said, oh, I get it, Jesus is Lord and Savior It's not about my actions making him Lord and Savior. It's not about me coming to church and being a good person that helps him save my life. It's about that Jesus has already saved me through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead and the gift of his spirit and the witness of his church to this very moment, I believe. And not only do I believe the past, I believe the future I believe ahead, just like David did, with the sight of a Savior he never saw with earthly eyes, but in his heart knew was right beside him. We too wait, like the 3,000 that day that received Christ, we join their throng and we commit ourselves knowing that waiting for the day we see him with our face, the day we have the sight of the Savior, isn't a pause button but an active work of moving together toward the day of his return. You see, waiting to hear from God is a great practice in our life. It's the right place for us to be. But when we wait to hear from God, we recognize we already have the witness of his word and the the history of the church and the movement of his spirit and the testimony of those who have decided to follow Christ. Waiting from God isn't about trying to find out the meaning of your life for your sake. It's not about trying to find out if, you know, I, I think I, 
I think that the purpose of my life is to be a rose bush. No. It's about already knowing. It's not, not about asking for you to know the meaning of your life for your sake. It's about, it's about what I'm saying is that when you follow Christ, it's a way of knowing that your life means so much to God that he gave you salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. Would you stand with me as we sing today? If you uh, want to share a decision you've made about following Christ, if you want to come and, and just have prayer, we can counsel after, we can counsel during. Let's, let's sing together, and as the Spirit moves, maybe it's just time for you to celebrate about the freedom He's given you, that He's your Messiah. Maybe it's the time you need to say, He is. Let's sing.